So, welcome to PPE TV, the first episode for PPE for People. And we're here today with Lee, the CEO, and we're going to discuss how PPE for People even came about and where it is today and how you as a buyer or a seller can use it. So, hi, Lee. Hi, Alistair. How are you? And you, you are um, and have been all through the crisis uh, stuck in Thailand, I believe. Yeah, I've, I've been here since mid-January, so like seven months, and I've just got a extended visa, so potentially I'm here for another year. Wow, and the whole and you're running the whole thing from Thailand completely remotely. Yeah, uh, obviously I'm six hours ahead, so it's a bit difficult to get in sync with the team. So what I try and do is come eight o'clock UK time, is I'm, I'm available with the team from about eight o'clock. So I'll start conversations and Slack and start work with them. And then I'll wake up to like late evening um, Phuket time. So I, I have a good chunk of like four to five hours of like daily time spent with the team. Uh, there's about eight of us at, at this minute, eight in the core team. That must so, be yeah. quite, quite useful yeah. in a way because actually you get stuff done when everybody's, everybody's still asleep. Is it, well, what, what happens is I tend to do all like my normal Phuket stuff in the morning. So I'll, you know, I'll go for breakfast, I'll go to the beach, I'll go to the gym. Um, so I'll get my normal day and then by the time the UK is waking up, I can get back to my apartment uh, and then start to, you know, do, do work on PPE. And how did you end up in Thailand? Uh, well, I, uh, I saw my last business at the end of last year uh, and I was originally going to go on like a three month sabbatical, like three month long holiday. Um, and then obviously got stuck here during COVID. So I had the chance to get on the last flight and go back to England. Um, but England was on lockdown, it was quarantine, it was pretty bad. Um, and I was enjoying myself. So I thought, you know, why, why, why go back to England? So I decided to take the risk and stay here. Then Thailand went on lockdown. Um, but it was, um, it was pretty good because like now as of like the 20th of July, Thailand hasn't had any COVID cases in 57 days. Any um, uh, homegrown COVID case. If you've had imports, people getting on flights wow. and so on. So it's pretty, much, it's pretty much eradicated now. So yeah, it was yeah started in January, stayed here, and um, yeah, you're safer there as well. The year. <laughs> you're actually safer there than back here. Here being the UK, obviously. Yeah. So you'd sold a business. You were basically taking a, a holiday. Um, you got stuck in Thailand. How on earth did you go from going to the beach and going to the gym? to creating PPE for people? Uh, well, uh, what happened is like sort of February, I, I was due to go back to the UK in March um, this year. Uh, and I was going to, sorry, no, April this year. I was going to start a business with, um, with a friend and um, he was going to be an investor and friend, which, which is Doug. Uh, and that was going to be sort of the start of summer this year. Then... COVID happened and me and Doug were in contact with each other and Doug was saying like he's seeing the stats of the COVID infection rate and he's like it's going to go crazy um, and then I started I, tr I tried to get test kits from China and send them to the UK and send them to Thailand and I, and I was going to try to get a bit of a business going with test kits not not to profit as such on, on the test kits but to try to help um, you know identify uh, people who have got it and had it um, and so that was my way of trying to help with the with the pandemic and Doug was getting you know getting me connections within Scottish NHS and also the UK NHS and that was yeah so that was basically what we were trying to do to help with the pandemic with the test kits but then the test kits become a real hot potato in terms of do they actually work do they don't work uh, the Chinese factories were getting slated and these are like multi-billion dollar factories in China uh, and they were getting some bad press from like the Euro European um, um, governments and so on so it it become really difficult to try to have an influence with test kits so we then decided to start going into PPE. Um, and was it fair criticism or was it just there were some bad test kits but actually they were fine and it's just it was just such a big unknown that people didn't know what they were buying and were, and were scared? Uh, it, it's still unproven today. I think what it was is that the, the test kits that were coming out of anywhere, it wasn't just a China-related issue. Um, the way that the process is done is quite new, uh, where it basically breaks down the, the blood samples into its DNA strands and so that you can actually see the, 
uh, the antibodies inside the blood. And um, so it was, I think it was new technology. It was, everything was quite rushed and the research yeah. and the data coming out was all like, you know, key to the moment. So I think the, the, the technology works for getting the, the amount of data and analysis to then judge uh, whether it was actually real or not. It, it, even today, I don't know whether there's a, a genuine antibody kit that can give you that the, the, the information needed um, that's needed to like, you know, start a cohort people into infected, non-infected, previously infected. It's, it's quite complicated. It's all, um, so it's just so new. I mean, it's like, it, it feels like a very long time, but it's not really, you know, it feels like months. I'm, I mean, uh, and you know, we, we locked down and March, the UK lockdown on March the 16th. And that feels like such a long time ago now. I mean, it's really extended the sort of the mental time frame. But in that time frame, you know, the scientists have pulled out probably some quite amazing stuff. It's just compressed for them compared to the normal years they would have, I guess. So you switched from test kits to PPE. Yeah. Um, and you had some potential suppliers in China. And I believe you had people on the ground as well who could actually check the quantities and the, and the quality yeah. and make sure everything was good. So, so I, I had background of working in China. So I've been to um, quite a few places in China over the last 15 years and doing QA and setting up factories and warehouses. So when, when Doug mentioned about getting uh, PPE from China, I had contacts there. So I think at one point we had five uh, Chinese people um, uh, on the ground checking factories for us. So we, we got to the point where we had like, a, uh, we were building a supply chain all the way from China, all the way to the UK. And, and we had like a, a tremendous um, uh, input from like loads of people from like really high level directors within, within the UK of like some blue chip companies, uh, even government backed people and uh, sort of government people. Um, it was just a, yeah, a, a load of uh, a load of interest. Everyone was trying to help get this supply chain set up. So there was at one point, I'd say we, we had maybe a hundred volunteers willing to help with the supply chain, but it was so complicated. It was really, re really a, a nightmare to try to get a supply chain all the way from China to the UK. Because what what happened is the Chinese government then started adding restrictions in the customs clearance. Um, about 5,000 suppliers went down to 100 suppliers. It was called the blacklist or the whitelist, I should say. So the whitelist was all the approved suppliers in China and the blacklist was all the non-approved suppliers. So as we were vetting suppliers, they were getting taken off the whitelist and put into blacklist. So we had to consistently try and have verify suppliers to get access to all of these goods and then bring into the UK then there's the financial side, the letters of credit, and you're talking, you know, tens of millions of pounds of, of kit that we would have to potentially then order on, on letters of credit and, or TTs. And it just got, yeah, it, it become quite a huge challenge. And I like, guess, I, yeah. Sorry, I guess financially, the other issue is, of course, with the way these things are ordered, um, anyone saying, I'll have a million pounds, please. Was actually having to, were they paying the full million up front or a, a significant amount of it? Well, a normal deal to, from China is normally you would find a supplier, you would then issue 50% up front and then 50% when goods are ready. So the majority of the deals, you would have to risk 100% of your money before the goods left China. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's a huge risk to people. Now, that, that's a normal way of doing business for, you know, for most people who deal with China. However, when you've got an explosion of, of buyers who need it, who have never dealt with this type of financial system before and deal in direct with China, it was really a, and you know, many nightmare scenarios were getting envisioned by these buyers in the UK. And most of them wouldn't want to commit 100% of their money up front to a company that they've never dealt with before. So it, it become a real stumbling box to try to get quality product from China into the UK and in, into the to the first line um, response, the second line response into the NHS, into doctors, clinics, and so on. It was, it become a real huge problem. So we had genuine intentions of getting, this was all non-profit. So we had genuine intentions of getting quality product from China into the front line, into the UK, but no one wanted to spend money. It was, you know, it just get, it just become a nightmare because it, it was a few nightmare scenarios of real stories where goods were getting held in customs in China, 
or the wrong goods were getting shipped into the UK. And so there was just like this wildfire of, of suspicion and rumors and, and it just become impossible to, to do business. Yeah, just impossible. But there must have been like, um, never mind the suspicion there would have been, and there were, um, cowboys and horror stories galore at the time. Because obviously, yeah. you know, people are willing to write big checks for something they're quite scared of, take some risk. And I guess I can see the difficulties of getting government to actually pay up front. Um, but I guess a lot of people would have been, not a lot, some people would have been burned because if you have 4,900 unregistered suppliers but who can make similar products in China, that stuff is still heading to, you know, the, to Europe and yeah. nobody knows until it gets there. And even some of the reports that they didn't even, when you got it, they didn't even know. Even those masks in Turkey, very famously, that the government bought weren't even suitable. Is that right? It, uh, yeah, there was uh, numerous um, part of stories. I think um, Italy, Italy government had test kits that failed to, uh, to test at the proper um, levels. Uh, I think Spain had similar issues with test kits. Uh, obviously, there was uh, you know rumours with with Turkey suppliers, but it was it, it wasn't isolated to any one country or any one supplier buyer. It was it was the wild west, mm. and what we were trying to do is take out that wild west um, issue away from the buyers to help them buy genuine product to help you know save people's lives. Uh, I, you know, some of the stories that we heard was you know government's military. Um, you know, taking ownership of, of goods designated to go to a buyer, you know, like a hospital or a private company. And, and the government would literally steal those goods uh, when the goods landed on the plane, you know, when the plane landed on the tarmac at an airport. Requisitioning it, by force almost. Yeah, yeah, it, it, was, it was going on, you know, numerous occasions. It wasn't just one off. It, it become a free for all, you know, everyone was trying to save each other's, you know, each other's lives. It was a, um, you know, if, though, if if someone found out about, you know, certainly like 3M masks landing in a certain airport and they had military there, there was, yeah, there was occasions where those military would, would go and take ownership of those goods. It was crazy. It's amazing because what you've actually got there is a situation where um, everyone's about the world uniting to fight uh, this disease. Um, government's all saying, however, they should all work together. But really, if you land uh, a million 3M masks on, uh, on our soil, we're going to have them. And if you don't want to give them to them, to give them to us, we're going to take them, and that actually happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It 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 definitely happened on, on numerous occasions. There'll be some reckonings after this, won't there? Because those stories are real, and they'll come out. And some governments are going to be quite embarrassed, I think, by what will seem, with the benefit of hindsight, won't seem quite so. Uh, uh, it will seem very selfish. Yeah, yeah. But, well, it does obviously, you know, with the EU, uh, what happens in 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 um in Italy. So I think um, Italy were you know really annoyed at the way that the EU handled um, the the protection of Italy. So you've got governments now you know having to go with each other about the way that mm. they should have dealt with things, uh, and yet you're going to have uh, you know governments getting accused of stealing you know people's goods on you know at, on on the tarmac of air, airports all around the world, and and I'm sure this is only the tip of the iceberg. You know we. We listen to these stories over like a say a two month period, but then we backed out out of that. It was just getting too risky. The buyers didn't want to send millions of pounds through our our network, and we can understand why. So the stories that I'm telling you now is just the tip of the iceberg. So once all this is is calmed down, I'm guessing there's going to be hundreds of stories with billions of dollars, um, you know, getting mentions. And, There's a book in there for you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, don't, I don't know them all, but uh, I'm sure someone, uh, you know, someone in, in these big supply chains knows all what was going on. But uh, yeah, the, the Wild West is definitely an app name that was getting banded about during this pandemic. Are you, is that your trademark for your book? The Wild, COVID Wild West? It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, Brigands maybe. and robbers on the high seas, quite literally. <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely a book there somewhere. Yeah. So I'm where, sure. so, so where, how does the, so where are you now, and how does the process work, and who's actually helping you now? Because you said you had hundreds of volunteers. I know that's now fewer, um, yeah. and the process is now more of a marketplace. Is that correct? So uh, what we've done is we've created a smart reverse auction. So okay. we've got a a list of 
um, approved suppliers, the majority registered in the UK. So uh, we're focusing on the UK and then we're going to start widening it to Europe and America and beyond. So th it's a reverse auction site where let's say I'm a care home and I want 5,000 masks. I would put my RFQ, which is a request for quote on the system, and up to 200 plus suppliers can then go and quote for that RFQ. So me as the care home, I then log into the system and I can see a whole host of uh, quotations, any, anywhere from um, whatever the market price of, of the, the mask is to below the market price to way above the market price. So everyone's obviously got different supply chains some can do it at the most competitive price. Some of them can't do it at the most competitive price. But it's not just about price. It's about uh, have you got CE certification for that product? Have you got product liability insurance for your company in case there's any claim? Um, also, there's like a, a rating system. So has anyone rated you? Have you done any transactions on the platform before? So it's early days. It's the, this smart reverse auction has only been live for about two weeks. Um, so it's, it's a case of getting enough buys and um, buys and sellers into the system to create this uh, momentum, which is where we are now. I think uh, at this precise moment, I'm getting told that there's 150 people live on the website at this minute. So we've gone from having one RFQ two weeks ago to, uh, you know, potentially we've got maybe 30 RFQs live at the site at this minute, maybe more, depends on how many of these. 181 people live on the site and do an RFQ. But obviously we've got buyers and sellers, so they're not all buyers. But it's early days. We, we haven't really done any promotion of the website. So it's it's going to be, you know, it, it should be a, a really good platform. If you want to get the best possible price from all the supply, from all the major buyers, sorry, all the major sellers in the UK, the buyers can go and get quotes. Within an hour, within an hour, you could have, a hundred quotations from a hundred approved suppliers for the product that you that you're wanting to buy. So I think there's a few things to unpack there. Um, there's the supply side, and there's the, when you said UK suppliers, are all the suppliers on there just now? Are they are they are they supplying into the UK or are they in the UK? The majority of the suppliers in our platform are based in the UK and. Um, Supply in the UK, but I'm, I'm guessing they will supply other parts of the world as well. But our platform is specifically built at this minute around UK registered suppliers. Okay. So UK suppliers that have got uh, limited companies in the UK and buyers registered in the UK, trading as companies or limited companies. But basically all these transactions will be predominantly UK based. So, so you're actually in, in effect not doing the validation itself into who is behind the company and et cetera, et cetera. But if they've got product liability insurance or they've got the CE certificates and there are, and you can obviously find them in company's house and validate at least that, then they can supply. And then so yeah. the buyers in the UK don't have to be limited companies though. So you could have uh, you know, a small, a small private care home can actually go on and say, you know, we want a small amount of masks, I guess. And the, supp yeah. the suppliers who do big volume stuff at cheap, really cheap prices won't quote for that because they don't want to send, you know, 5,000 masks maybe. But somebody else will. It would be slightly more expensive, but you can get it tomorrow, et cetera. So there's, you've got kind yeah. of three three levers, speed, price, and uh, quantity, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, so we've got quotes on the system now, RFQs for five items, 10 items that okay. might have a value of £10, £20. But we've also got quotes on this system that, you know, arranging from five million to 10 million pounds. Okay. So you, there's, there's this, you know, um, wide variety of really small orders and really huge orders, but 80% of our quotes are gonna land somewhere between a few thousand pounds and say 80,000 pounds. That's gonna be the sort of average sort of orders in, in the middle. So we're trying to work out a way to handle the small orders in, in the best cost effective uh, and delivery uh, focused way uh, and then where you've got the huge orders which are going to be directly with the factories and and then they start to like look at the letters of credit and all of those big financial mechanisms needed yeah. for, the big, for the big orders so yeah there's like so the small medium and large and 80 percent are going to be medium order size now i guess this will sort it because it's all brand new right so this is going to sort itself out i guess because you should have um suppliers being able to start saying, well, we're not going to we're not going to quote on anything below this volume or this price, so therefore you won't send them the quote for the, you know Alice's ten FFP two masks, 
Um, and then you'll get suppliers who say, we are, we're not cheap because we actually have it in stock and we've bought it ourselves. Therefore, they can't do the scale price, but then they can, they can deliver it to somebody in the next yeah. day. Uh, well, months. we've got an option on the platform now where a supplier can actually put in uh, all the products that, are, that we sell on the platform. I've got set in. So you could say, um, these are the products that I supply. And I don't want to quote. I don't want to be. No, I don't want to be notified of any RFQ that is less than this quantity. Yeah. Uh, for this for this particular product. So the suppliers who have got minimum order quantities can go into the platform and set the threshold level so that they don't get bombarded with hundreds of quotes that they don't want to be quoting because it's too small. Whereas yeah. you might get um, on the flip side, you'll have suppliers who focus on high volume low value orders who will then that'll be their bread and butter and they can say yeah i don't want to be notified of anything above a thousand because it's not my business i want to i just want to have all the small orders so we want to try and make that as easy as possible but uh, with with you know web-based platforms everything is trial and error and iterating so we are on a daily basis getting feedback from buyers and sellers and we are changing and adapting the platform hour by hour to until we find this like equilibrium where we try and make as many people as happy as possible. We can't make everyone happy, obviously, but we'll try and make as many buyers and sellers as happy as possible with the platform so we can cover the majority of the orders. Um, and it's still quite amazing because it's like day 80 of this or since you started yeah, it? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it was 7th of April. 7th of April is when, when we, we got going. So yeah. So you're yeah, roughly day 75 ish. And you've had yeah, two iterations. You've got hundreds of uh, suppliers who are actually accredited in some way, shape, or form, even if it's just they've got product liability insurance. You've got buyers placing orders for millions of pounds, and yeah. it's day seventy-five. I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine a, another st startup, if uh, to use the word, uh, that language, which in seventy-five days has got hundreds of buyers and sellers, and is processing them from a, like a one-pound or ten-pound order to a million-pound order. It's not it's not very common. No, no, not, not, not at all. It's, it's probably the fastest startup I've been involved in. I've been involved with, this is my fourth tech company startup uh, as, a, as a founder. And um, I think a re oh, since, the, since the 7th of April to now, we've had over a thousand buyers registered with the site. And a, an average order quantity is somewhere between five to 10,000. So a few times that by the thousand buyers, um, it, it's in it's it's in the tens of millions of PPE requested items. So you know, for that to go from zero to tens of yeah. millions of requests is is phenomenal. But I, you know, it's probably to do with the pandemic. You know, within a within ex, extraordinary times, strange times with um with the with the agency and the threat of, of COVID. It's just we we've been in. Um, the right place at the wrong time, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, so, obviously, yeah. no one wanted this to happen, but we, we, we've just tried to help. We, we, our intention has been genuine, 100% genuine. We've been non-profit for the first three months. We're, we're still non-profit. You know, we think we, we, we're going to have to adapt the strategy at some point. But our strategy is to help as many companies and people get genuine PPE but as cheap as possible, as fast as possible, without getting ripped off, and, and that's been our ethos. Our ethos, sorry, from uh, from day one to where we are now. And every, um, everyone's a volunteer in the in the in yeah, the team. Yeah, every, everyone's a volunteer at, at this moment in time. We've obviously got um, a limited company set up now, and uh, the cost of the business is being funded by Doug. So Doug Scott is is founder, my partner, and an investor. So any cost associated to running the running the business, Doug's been uh, funding from his, his own his own cash. Uh, and in fact, Doug actually bought sixty thousand masks himself out of his own money, and he was distributing masks to care homes in, in Litchfield and, and Solly and beyond. So it's 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 all been born from a genuine need to help people. And hence, the, you know, the name of the company. Yes, and I can't. There's no, I think, um, and also professionalizing a little bit. Um, finding some way to take some margin so you can actually have full-time staff actually helps makes it more likely that the system will just improve and get better because there's no reason of course that this could not work in any European country because you're going to have suppliers that are covering Europe you're going to have suppliers that cover the globe some of whom you've already got and then then it becomes a, a point of 
how can you build the system or the systems so that it, it scales itself? Because yeah. you could go down the road of, you know, you could get volunteers to translate it, um, volunteers in every country. You only need one expert per country to tell you what kind of, you know, is product liability, you know, what, what is the equivalent in that country? Um, and then, of course, it just grows itself, I guess. As long as you've got a core team, you can pay to help manage the process with the volunteers in the sort of further out uh, vision. Yeah, we definitely want to scale. I think the 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 concept of this minute is get the UK uh, product market fit, which is a term a terminology in, in you know startups where you get the product right that fits the market, and, and we're close. We're, we're close to getting that um, that synchronisation with the market and the product. Once we've got the UK market pretty much sorted and delivered on what we expect. Then we we can scale and uh, you know across the world into Europe into America, where how we do it in terms of the resources needed, volunteers paid, it's going to be a difficult one because everyone all the all the countries globally have got different dynamics with um, the level of COVID and the level of death rate and so on. So whether we could get volunteers in every country, I don't know, but I think uh, the idea is to go and raise investment um, at some point so that we can then start scaling into different countries and help um, different company, uh, sorry, different countries get access to this platform to keep the price gouging down, to keep the quality of product delivered into the different countries as high as possible. So yeah, the, plat the platform is scalable um, into multiple languages and multiple countries. How we do it, we don't really know at this point right. in terms of finance. The, unknown, the, unknown, the unknown roadmap. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So we, we know what we need to do. Who's going to fund it and how it happens? We don't know at this point. But it can. But there's no reason it can't because I, I think you just touched on something really interesting there. It stops the price gouging, and it means that you have a safe place to buy it because yeah. there must have been a mad scramble for this stuff within the care home sector, and they must yeah. have bought it from just about anyone, whether it was any good or not. And to move it to a point where actually if I can go here and it's accredited and it's safe and I'll get it and I, and I won't be ripped off. I think that's the key thing because remember some of the pricing you showed me at the beginning and the same mask was like, you know, 25p per unit if you bought 5,000 or £2.50 a unit if you bought 5,000. There's some people lying in beaches today who have got a lot to answer for, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and price gouging is definitely going to be looked upon um, certainly by the UK government come the end of this year. What Once yeah. the initial um, panic is over, there's going to be some people potentially going to jail. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think they I think they deserve to go to jail. Um, you know, we, we're talking like 10 times the normal value. And even though the supply chain, the cost of flights from Asia into the UK went up, you know, horrifically and the cost of the raw materials went up, yet the price gouging was way above... The, the inflation rate of, you know, the cost of the supply chain. People were just, you know, um, maliciously putting the prices up just to get, you know, just to make it um, more profit and more profit. So our system completely reverses that. Our system goes from, uh, you know, allowing people to, you know, to quote, uh, allowing buyers to be ripped off by going to the market. This is our own internal market, which makes a competitive a healthy competitive place to get the best price and in fact i've seen some of the quotations where you know on our platform that go from say hypothetically you know three pound for a mask or you know down to you know atp for a mask like for the n95 mask for example um whereas those masks i think at the height of um covid in march and april n95 masks were anywhere from like you know four or five five pounds for a mask I, now, saw them, I saw them at 10. I saw like a box of 10 yeah. for 100 quid. It's just so staggering, yeah, isn't it? Retail, yeah, we, retail, yeah, probably even more. It, it's it's crazy. Uh, you know, I, I'm talking trade prices for like volumes of like, you know, 10,000, 20,000. Mm. It's, uh, it's crazy. It, it was crazy. It's calmed down a bit now. But, uh, but anyway, our platform tries to strip out the, the players. But also, just to be clear, it's not just, we talked about masks probably a bit too often. It's not just masks. I mean, it's it's any form of PPE, correct? Well, we, we've got round about 25 individual product SKUs on the website at this minute. Uh, but to give you some idea, so 3M, who everyone knows as a 
one of the main players. They've got 5,000 individual SKUs for their PPE division. Just, just wow. their PPE, 5,000 SKUs. So if you then times that by the other 100 PPE players, the Honeywells and all of them type of companies, you're probably looking at, I don't know, 100,000 individual SKUs for PPE globally, maybe more. But that's a minimum, 100,000. So our platform is just focused on the core products, but it's going to scale. So we're going to, we're going to be looking to scale the PPE product range in accordance to the global market and then allow all the distributors and resellers and all the supply chain to then add all of their products into this platform and create a global reverse auction platform for all of these PPE products in the tens of thousands. That's quite ambitious. He says that. What well, does it? Well, my goal is to build the uh, single most largest PPE marketplace. Uh, yeah, I, I think yeah, that is the goal. Yeah, the, the goal is to create a, a global PPE reverse auction platform for every PPE item that is needed by you know by consumers, yeah, both business consumers and. Yes, that's 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 the big shift, isn't it? It's not just. You know, it went from, I think that's why we got told not to wear masks because there weren't any for, for the NHS. But I think that's the big shift, isn't it? It's not just, you know, if you run a mum and pop uh, corner shop, you'll want a supply of masks to get people as they arrive at the shop because they will turn up and have forgotten them and then they'll still want into the shop. And then you've got anyone who's visiting elderly parents or wants to get together. I mean, there is sort of this weird uh, sort of dance right now between groups of people who can get together and not wear masks and yet if you go to shop you have to wear a mask and i think that's confusing some people slightly maybe but i think you've got that you've got this so you what you're basically is we've got the key today you've got the key components people need masks gowns gloves all that kind of stuff yeah. and yeah and, and i as an individual as a consumer can just go on there and buy if i want to buy a box of each of these things for my family i can go into that i don't need to be you know in the in the in the health sector yeah, uh, yeah. We, uh, everyone needs masks. Uh, I think globally, uh, everyone from whether it's you know the man in the street to the you know to the hospitals, it's uh, it's both a consumer item and a, uh, a a business item that's needed by everyone. Like here in Thailand, I, I went to a cafe uh, a few days ago, and they're selling um, they're selling hand sanitizer. At, you know, at the sh- at the shop mm-hmm. front, uh, by you know by the on the counter. And, and this is a cafe, and this is this is not just an exception. Yeah. This is everyone, even you know some restaurants that actually selling masks. As no, you I, can, say, you, I can absolutely believe it. I don't see why they wouldn't, because you've got to wear one to go in. So you rock up at Ted Baker or wherever. Why did you would not if you don't have one? You have to buy one. And you can yeah. see that the, the, you know the, in America you've got the kind of we're not wearing mask brigade and people. You know, I, I saw a great thing of the guy put up a mirror outside his uh, outside his restaurant. And he said, um, if you're not willing to wear a mask, look here. And there's an arrow pointing at the mirror. And the mirror just had etched in it. Hey, stupid, don't come in. And you and you get this thing where people don't want to wear them. Um, I think the American situation is slightly different. But people don't want to wear them because the, in, in their sense, it's like it's, they're being forced to wear them. And other people just don't think it's needed. You know, there's a, I know there's certain people I know who don't think it's needed. And some of them have been to the pub and think it's all great and it's all normal. And for the rest of us, we think, well, I wear the mask because I'm looking after other people, right? not because I'm looking after me. And if we all wear one, that's how it stops. And obviously your experience in Asia, it's been quite common if you've got a cold or flu to wear a mask just to, to stop you spreading it. Yeah, uh, well, I, I remember I had to do a visa run just before COVID, I had to go to Malaysia to get uh, a stamp in my visa to get back into Thailand. Um, and basically I, I had to, I was going to go for a week into Malaysia, and as COVID's getting worse and worse, basically all the countries are going into lockdown. So I had to get on the plane, go to Malaysia, and I literally got on the next flight back to Thailand. But when I was in Malaysia, I seen it was um, the the Mars, uh, sorry, Mars, sorry, Mars, which is the uh, the Middle Eastern uh, flu virus and SARS and COVID. So Malaysia's been checking temperatures and looking for people that may be infected with multiple viruses uh, for, you know essentially for years and it's the same in Singapore and Hong Kong so that's why everyone's you know walking around with masks in all the major Asian airports way before COVID because of SARS and MERS it, you know they were on, on the radar for the last few years. Yeah I think we assume it's coming with you. <laughs> well, well, well the epic yeah, did and like hence why you know, a lot of these um, a lot of these Asian countries, Malaysia, Singapore, mm. 
Vietnam, their COVID ratios are really low. So because they had, pre, you know, they have prior experience with with SARS and MERS over the last, you know, ten years or so, where they they already had systems in place. As I say, Thailand hasn't had a, a local. COVID case for 57 days, and that was today, that was the news today. So Thailand's got a grip of COVID really well, and it's the same in Vietnam, Singapore, mm. Malaysia, and probably many other... It's, it's, it's cultural. They, they've been, they've adapted to it before, they're used to it, they've got the systems in place, and and Europe and the rest of the world just didn't, I yeah. guess. But well, the other thing, if you don't, if, you're, if you get caught not wearing a mask in Thailand, it's a 20,000 baht fine, uh, which is... Four hundred and fifty pounds. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. that's that's so, yeah, that's a lot. So, yeah, so the, the the laws and the implementation of the laws in Thailand are way way more draconian than in the UK. In the UK, everyone was basically doing what they want. Most of the <laughs> they still are. I won't yeah. even tell you what the noise I could hear from the local pub last night. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so, yeah. I think that it'll come if it comes back, especially the second wave. Then. It will get stricter because there cannot be any of this. I suggest you do this if you're going to do that. If you think it's a good idea, it's going to change, isn't it? And I guess that's why PP for people is a great thing because people will will then all as consumers need to buy it now. Whether they buy it from PP for people is is, is a moot point because they, but they'll need to buy it from somewhere. And every retailer that like you were saying earlier, um, like the corner shops and so on, why would they not have? A, a whole section of uh, gloves, masks, uh, hand sanitizer, gels, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't make. And also, if you're looking after elderly parents and all this kind of stuff, you know that you should have uh, gowns and all this kind of stuff. It just makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we, what we want to do is obviously we don't we don't process the transaction on people. People, we we want to be like the you know the money supermarket dot com mm-hmm. of, of PPE market um, in order to um, reduce uh, reduce the prices. Keep people honest, you know. Have pre-approved suppliers. So ultimately, it's yeah, it, it's a it's a platform. We want to be like the, the the company that you go to to get a to get your quotation, whether you're yeah, a small makes company sense. Or, or even an individual or a, or a huge organization. We we keep that price competitiveness going. I can't think of another platform in the UK and maybe globally that allows this type of you know, literally hundreds of suppliers quoting for your for your needs, whether it's five masks or whether it's a million masks. You've got hundreds of suppliers, you know, uh, all competing. And, and w- what we're going to add as well is a an ability to rebid. So you at this minute, a supplier will give a bid for for your ten thousand masks, uh, and then that's it. The, the the auction ends, and then whoever wins. But we're going to even to create more competitiveness. We're going to allow suppliers to reduce their bids not increase their bids but to reduce their bids to, to even to make it even more competitive so, so, the you, whole, yeah. so you tell them that you tell them that they're out and then they can actually go oh, hold on a sec go down five percent and see if i stay in yeah, yeah. Well, so we're, why we're wouldn't going, you auto, why wouldn't you automate that wouldn't that just be simple just to automate so that they can yeah, just well, well, set we're, a we're bunch to, of rules we're, we're going to yeah we're, we're creating the logic in the platform now um, depending on like the average price, because obviously you you yeah. you can have someone who goes in at fifty p a mask, and someone comes in at five pounds a mask, just for argument's sake. Then you've got this huge average. That this you've got this. Um, uh, okay. You've got yeah. an average that doesn't really represent the average because you've got these extreme prices. There's a difference between the average bid, uh, average sale bid price, and the actual average purchase price because nobody's going to buy them at a fiver. So yeah, if there true. were 50p to a fiver, but actually the majority of them are going to sit right down here, 50p to 75p or whatever. Yeah. And then you've got this outlier. So you need to sort of exclude the outlier. So now when I go and buy 5,000, I don't see that. I just see the yeah. ones that are closer to the reality. Well, as, as, the, as the platform um, develops and as orders increase through the platform, we're going to get... Yeah, we're going to have some clever AI in the background looking at the pricing structures uh, and getting the average, as you say, the actual purchase price, not just the quoted price, and it's going to change. So the more the more users that use the platform, the cleverer the platform is going to get. Yeah, yeah that makes the, sense. The, the more the more accurate the data. So yeah, what we, what we want to do is be like the the price and index sites for all the for the UK. So yeah. if you want to know what the going prices are for your P, of PPE, then we're going to have real time data on the homepage to allow everyone to see what the what the average prices are, whether it's the small orders, the medium size orders, or the large orders. So obviously. 
you know, prices are dictated by quantity. But we're going to try and split it into the, the small, medium and large categories so that you know uh, what, the, what, the, what the price that you should be paying based on the, the data analysis that we're doing from all the buyers and sellers. Well, that's fantastic and a very interesting interview. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thanks, Alice. Well, that was that was a really interesting first episode of PPE TV, and thank you, Lee, for coming on. Lee is the CEO of PPE for People, who is uh, behind this TV station, as we call it. We're going to be interviewing some buyers, some sellers, and also updating you uh, visually with how the website works and new functions and features on the website to help make buying PPE a better experience. That's it for today. Thank you. <laughs>